Hi, welcome to Instrumental Analysis. In week seven here, we're talking about spectroscopy. And we're going to start in this lecture talking about the instrument itself, the spectro spectrometer or the spectrophotometer. And again, it's one of our many magic boxes that we've seen in this particular course. And in this case, one of the differences is you're finally not injecting a sample into the box. You're not doing this. What you're doing is you're placing the sample in the box, and the box is analyzing it over time. And the form the sample takes is something we'll talk about in today's lecture. It can be a vial containing a solution, or as is typically the case in IR, it's a, it's a very specialized liquid, or it's sometimes even a, a pressed pellet of a solid powder. And what you get out, the output, is the spectrum. <coughs> so you're not measuring things in as you were with chromatography. You're simply getting one data set, which is a picture of how the sample is absorbing light as a function of incident wavelength. That's the spectrum, and that's the whole goal of the instruments that we're going to be talking about. So here's a pretty typical research-grade UV biz. They're found all over the place, and most research labs have them. They're not that big. They have a computer attached. In this case, there's a flow system, so there's a flow cell set up, so they're doing a kinetic measurement versus time. But as you can see, it's a pretty straightforward instrument. Now, if you open up the guts of this thing, this is what you would see. You need to have a source of radiation. So you need a light source. You need to select out a wavelength. You need to interact with your sample. So you got to think of the sample pieces. You got to detect the light and then convert that, of course, to a signal that you can read. Now, there's a couple of things about the simple diagram that are going to be changing as we go through our conversation about spectrophotometers. First, is it the position of the sample and the wavelength? It is way more conventional, in my experience, that the sample comes and you put white light through the sample, and then you select out the wavelength. There's some exceptions, but that's much more conventional. The other thing that's very common, we'll talk about this more in the next mini lecture, is you almost always have a second path for the blank. If you remember in the last lecture, we talked about the need to correct for all of the internal issues that can affect the absorbance of samples. So here, what we're going to be doing is always, almost always having what's called a double beam system, or a system that simultaneously measures a blank as it's measuring a sample. And that gives us the ability to ratio out any fluctuations that may occur in the lamp. OK, let's talk a little bit about the materials that make up the system. And it starts with a simple decision, which is what do you put your sample in? And that's actually a really complicated decision for optical and infrared spectroscopy, because not every material is good. If you tried to do uv vis spectroscopy in a glass cuvette, you would be blind to anything below 400 nanometers. So anything in the ultraviolet, where some of the best organic chromophores absorb, you wouldn't be able to see them because the glass would be absorbing that light. It would be black. So you need materials to encase your samples, to serve as windows, that don't absorb the light you're interested in. And this is important in UV vis. It means you're going to use a lot of quartz. Uh, quartz cuvettes, which can be very expensive, uh, give you the window out to 160 nanometers in some cases. Now, for infrared, a lot of salts, luckily, like sodium chloride, silver chloride, KBR, don't absorb infrared light. The downside is what would happen if you put your sample in a sodium chloride cuvette? Well, if it was toluene, it might be OK. But if it's water, it dissolves it, right? So to do aqueous samples in infrared can be a little bit tricky, because all the materials to contain your sample will be dissolved. So um, it's one of those areas where there are always workarounds. But as you're thinking about applying the measurement in a practical sense, thinking through the materials ends up being important. These are just some examples of typical vials you would use for UV biz. I, in my experience, UV biz is used most frequently for liquids. Beer saw is very hard to apply to, for example, powders, although increasingly you're seeing something called diffuse reflectance, which is a way to kind of in integrating spheres to sort of get a sense of the reflectance of powders. But for real quantitative analysis, you're going to typically do it on, on liquids that you can see through. They may be colored, but remember, they have to be see-through. For infrared, it's a lot, actually a much more of a hassle to make your samples. <clears throat> you're typically, you can run liquids. You can Some liquids are fairly open in the infrared. But remember, almost any molecule absorbs in the infrared. So it's a real challenge to find an organic liquid that, that lets you dissolve the sample. <clears throat> it doesn't introduce a lot of its own peaks. One of the methodologies that is becoming a lot more common that I just showed you a picture of here is actually attenuated total reflection. So rather than putting the sample directly in the infrared light, you put it on top of something called an ATR plate, in which light's coming in, but it's bouncing off the interfaces, kind of shown over here in this picture. And every time it bounces off the interface, it absorbs and interacts with some of the sample. And then it bounces down. So you can get a lot of paths in an ATR plate. 
And you don't really have to worry about sample prep because the only thing you have to concern yourself with is that the ATR plate itself doesn't absorb light. So what you see up here are two typical ATR plates. One is for liquids where this little divot holds the liquid and the actual ATR plate is orange. That's what you see underneath it. Or in this example where you might pack a powder in. So ATR plates are becoming more and more common because they get around some of the hassle of really creating good IR samples, especially given the limitations in the window materials that you have. There's no quartz really for infrared. You have to use salt plates which dissolve and corrode. So this has really become a popular methodology. Let's talk a little bit then about light sources. You have to put your sample in the spectrometer. We've talked about the need to have windows that don't absorb the light that you're interested in. And so that graph I showed you before can be useful for picking out what material to use for what wavelength. The other thing is your light source. You've got to provide the light. So this table, I think, does a pretty good job of covering the main light sources that one would be interested in. And the only point I want to make here is that often you have to decide and make a trade-off between intensity of light and whether you want all wavelengths. So shown over here is a continuum spectrum put up against a spectrum with very discrete wavelengths. And often when you're doing spectroscopy, because you're doing a range of wavelengths, not just one, you typically really need to pick a continuum source. But sometimes you, you find that you don't get quite as much light out of it. In any case, that's a very important distinction. Is it continuum or does it have discrete wavelengths? One of the challenges then when you use these, as you can see here, is that over some frequencies, your light source starts to drop off. There's no universal light source that gives you the same number of photons over every wavelength you're interested in. So what you often do in the spectrometers is you find that they switch the light sources. And this is really common in UV vis. So you almost always use a tungsten lamp, which has this kind of intensity versus wavelength plot. So it gives you plenty of photons kind of starting at 500 and going to 1,000. So you have a lot of light to play with in your system. But if you're interested in spectroscopy, at higher wave or shorter wavelengths than 400 or 500 nanometers, you kind of got nothing with a tungsten lamp. So you switch to deuterium, which has the advantage of peaking in the ultraviolet but having a low visible wavelength um, intensity. So many, many UV visits will have a switch between deuterium and tungsten. Sometimes you'll hear it when you're scanning, clunk, and sometimes you'll see just a little bit of a glitch because, you know, depending on the speed of the scan that you're doing, and you change a particular optic in your system, you can sometimes see a glitch. It's usually right around 400, maybe 450 nanometers. So often you do combine light sources so that you have plenty of light over the full range of the spectra that you're interested in. Anyhow, that's kind of a, a brief introduction to the spectrophotometer. We talked a little bit about the importance of making sure your materials don't absorb the wavelengths of interest, and also what kinds of sources you might use to generate the light. In the next mini lecture, we'll talk about the other side, which is, of course, splitting the wavelengths that come out and detecting them. Thanks so much. See you next time.